Hey, uh, that's me then. Uh, let's get started. Let's go to the slides straight away. Okay, good. Um, hi everyone, my name is Martin Brown, and today I am very excited to talk to you about Rainbow Cake. Rainbow Cake is an Android architecture framework slash library slash concept slash thingy. I sometimes have a hard time describing what it is exactly, but the point is that it's a framework most of the time. And what I mean by a framework is that it's a set of libraries on one hand. So it's code that you can reuse, you can include in your projects as a dependency and build upon. Plus it's also guidance to go along with this. So both on how to use this code as well as on other parts of architecting your applications. This might sound familiar to you. Jetpack itself is also a set of libraries, some Android X stuff, as well as guidance, Google's architecture guide. So Rainbow Cake is something similar, but it builds on top of Jetpack and it's a lot more opinionated, a lot stricter. Rainbow Cake being an architecture framework is um, quite opinionated and it covers a lot of different fields. So it um, weighs in on dependency injection, threading, and all these other things. These are just some examples on the slide. So I think it's important to put a disclaimer up here at the very top of the talk to tell you that Rainbow Cake will not be a silver bullet. It will not be the single solution that everyone has to use for Android applications, but it's a set of concepts that we know work fairly well together and it is being used in production already. Also, Rainbow Cake does not exist in a vacuum. There are a whole bunch of other libraries that do something for your Android architecture. So if you are in charge of making decisions about architecture, then you should probably take a look at most or even uh, all of these and then see what you can grab from each of them to fit your specific needs. Let me give you a bit of history about Rainbow Cake. So it started its development back in May of 2018. This was back at my previous employer and I started developing a brand new application from scratch using Kotlin. This was our first Kotlin application. So I had a chance to figure out our architecture for um, upcoming Kotlin apps. And this worked out quite well. And we've moved the architectural bits of this initial application into a separate library a few months later. So this is what eventually became Rainbow Cake. Then in the November of this year, there was a workshop that I've done about architecting Kotlin apps. And here I showcased a simplified version of what we had at the time internally, but the materials for this are still publicly available. So you can have a look at this on GitHub. It's gonna be a simplified version of Rainbow Cake, but a lot of good description about the theory behind it. In 2019, there was a lot of work done on the framework. So for example, it was split up into multiple modules. This meant that we wouldn't have to pull in the entire thing all at once in a single dependency, but we could pick and choose the parts that we needed. Then it started moving towards a more open thing and going more public. So it was repackaged from the company's domain into my own, which meant that um, it was repackaged. Let's just go with that. Um, so its documentation was also, also moved from an internal thing to a public website where it's still available today. And the next month it was moved to GitHub. So the actual code was published as well. And also the framework uh, started being published on Maven Central. Something fun happened in the June of 2019. I was at last year's Kotliners conference and someone walked up to me and told me that they really enjoyed using Rainbow Cake, which was quite surprising since at this time it was really not very public, uh, just technically public. And they also told me that they didn't like that it was so tied to using Dagger. So I told them that I would see what I could do. And I ended up sitting down the next day and stripping out all of the Dagger dependencies from the framework. So now there are two modules that ship with Rainbow Cake. One of them integrates Dagger and the other integrates Coin for it. Plus you can also do any other kind of DI solution that you want. Uh, late last year, there was a testing module introduced for Rainbow Cake to help um, testing your view states and events easier. And this year, just last month, I finally made the jump to Android X with the framework. I was holding out on this for a while uh, since there were older apps built on Rainbow Cake and I didn't want to uh, force them to migrate, but I figured that it was really time by now. 
Then I'm going to be brave and I'm going to put one more thing on this timeline, which is going to be the 1.0 of the framework. So this marker is for this month. The 1.0 has not been released yet, but we are very close to it now. I'm basically just shuffling documentation around. The framework itself has been production ready and stable for um, a very, very long time. So uh, this is just uh, some final touches, and then it's going to be uh, 1.0 very soon in probably a matter of days now. For some more context, here are the previous releases of Framework Cake. So there have been more than a dozen releases of the framework previously. And also, here are some of the first releases and announcements of the other libraries I've mentioned earlier. As you can see, these kept appearing on the scene as I was working on Rainbow Cake, still sort of in private. And I was quite happy to see this. On one hand, it's nice to have more people thinking about the same things and uh, putting ideas out there in the community. Plus, most of these were heading in the same general direction that I was going in with Rainbow Cake. So this meant that I was probably doing something sensible if um, other people were getting to the same conclusions and ideas. OK, whenever I introduce Rainbow Cake to people, I used to show them this very scary chart, which is a representation of classes in an application built on Rainbow Cake. And there's a lot about Rainbow Cake that could be explained on this, but I'm not going to do that to you today. So we're just going to simplify this into the layers that it has. And even within this, these are not all really layers of a Rainbow Cake application. Two of these are just implementation details of some other layers, so we're going to get rid of those. And that gets us to the five actual layers inside a Rainbow Cake app. Um, you, as you can see, Rainbow Cake covers the uh, architecture of an app top to bottom, so all the way from the UI layer to the data sources. It's not just about your architecture, even though, funnily enough, that's all I'm going to talk to you about today. And also, uh, these layers and this initial colorful chart uh, combined with Android's love for naming things after desserts is what gave Rainbow Cake its name and now logo, which is new as of today. So uh, for this talk, though, we are going to focus on just the two top things, um, the two top layers, which is the view model and the fragment. Fragment here is a simplification. So uh, really, the top layer is the view layer, but it's going to be a fragment most of the time, and it's easier to think like that for the purposes of this talk. But in the documentation, this is called the view layer for Rainbow Cake. So let's talk about the history of what we do here on Android in uh, this space. So the most popular and most well-known architecture for views is probably MVP. Uh, it's a classic. A lot of people have uh, learned this as their first view architecture, uh, which was like the first step up from no architecture to some architecture. And MVP separates business logic from the view, which is great. It can be unit tested separately, doesn't depend on framework classes. It has the presenter acting as a component between the view and the model and coordinating all the interactions. And whenever it needs to update the UI, it calls methods on an interface. Then we started moving towards MVVM which also has this component sitting in the middle coordinating things, which is now called the view model. And um, most notably, instead of calling methods on an interface, it exposes some kind of observable state to the view, which can react to changes in that state and update itself. Also, data binding is sometimes associated with MVVM, although it's not strictly required for it, but they do make a good pair. Finally, there's the new kit on the block, MVI. And MVI has also been around for a couple of years, so it's not actually that new, but I think it's still gaining popularity within the community. And one of its core concepts is that it has a single view state describing every screen. Then it uses reactive streams in its implementation. So uh, most of the time, this is going to be Rx, but there are a few alternatives. And it converts every input event into objects, which can then travel in these streams. And they get combined with the current view state in a reducer pattern, which takes the state of the inputs and produces a new state, which then updates the UI at the end. For Rainbow Cake, I am somewhere between MVVM and MVI. So Rainbow Cake is going to be an MVVM solution. It doesn't use data binding, although I'm thinking about um, putting support for data binding in the framework. But it takes the idea from MVI of a single view state, um, which uh, I found quite useful. I won't go into more detail uh, about these um, theoretical parts in this talk. However, you'll find a lot of uh, written things about this and the resources at the end of the talk. So uh, with that, uh, that's the theory out of the way. Now let's get to the actual code. And we're going to start with the state handling part. 
I'm going to show you two things here. On the top of the slide, I will be implementing Rainbow Cake itself. And so we're going to write the framework code. And then on the bottom of the slide, you're going to see an app being built on top of the framework. For state handling and event handling too, uh, Rainbow Cake uses base classes, for example, Rainbow Cake View Model. Base classes, of course, are not the ultimate way of sharing code between uh, different screens and classes. But I think that in this case, they are worth the trade-off. As mentioned already, Rainbow Cake builds on top of Jetpack. So our base view model is a Jetpack view model. And inside, it will hold the single state I've talked about previously in a live data. We're using the usual pattern for live data here, which is that we have a public property, which is um, read-only, and it has the live data type. And this property is exposing a backing property, which actually contains a mutable live data instance and has limited visibility so that it can't be accessed from outside the view model. Then we have to decide what the type of the values sitting in the state is going to be. And since this will be different for each screen, we are going to make this a generic type parameter for the base class. And we are going to constrain this to the any type uh, as its upper bound. This is important because this is what guarantees that nobody uses a nullable type as the parameter here, which means that there will never be a time uh, during the usage of Rainbow Cake when the state is null. We would, of course, have to provide this type on the client side as well, something like this. And most of the time with single view states, we're either going to be using data classes or sealed classes for that one view state or a combination of the two. So for the sake of these slides and the example here, I am using a sealed class with just two very simple cases. One of them is a loading state, which is implemented as an object because it doesn't need to hold any values. And the other one is the state for when we have already loaded the profile which uh, is implemented as a data class because it will contain a name uh, that can be displayed on the UI. For more about designing view states like this, again, please see some of the resources at the end. OK, the next thing that Rainbow Cake does for your state is that it will call a live data transformation on it. So this is an extension function called distinct, which will um, transform your live, da live data so that if you set a value for your state, which is the same as what it was already holding. So if you are uh, placing the same value into the live data the second time, then it actually won't notify its observers since they don't have any updates to do on the UI anyway, because the state hasn't changed. So this small optimization um, is implemented here. And again, you can find the source for this transformation in the resources. The next thing is going to be that we'll add a parameter to the base class, which is an initial state. This is to make sure that we never forget to uh, set some kind of initial state uh, for our live data. When we create a live data instance, there is no values in it. So by forcing um, the client code to pass in a state to the view, base view model and then immediately placing that into the live data in an initializer block, we guarantee that we always have something in there. For the example, I am going to place the loading state there, uh, which uh, works well enough most of the time. But in real applications, you might want to have separate initial and loading states so that you can distinguish between the two in your view model. And with all of this set up, what we have left is um, to actually make state changes in the implementation. So we are, we're going to add a method called load profile here, which starts a coroutine with the Jetpack view model scope extension and launching a coroutine in there. A small note, I am using these constructs for starting the coroutine since I hope that you are familiar with them. Uh, so it's to simplify the slides, but Rainbow Cake actually ships its own coroutine builder and own coroutine scope uh, included in the view model. So you can also use those if you like the features it provides, again, in the docs. So to make state changes uh, with the current setup, what we have to do is take the private live data or the protected one and then assign new values to it. So you can see that inside the coroutine, I'm first setting it to a loading state. Then I'm calling a suspending load username function to fetch the data that should be displayed on the UI. And then I am updating the state uh, by creating a profile loaded and placing that name in there. Now, uh, this syntax is not great. So we have to use this slightly ugly name for the backing property with the underscore in it. And we have to keep referring to the value property of live data to set these. And if we weren't using a sealed class, but if we went with a data class for our state instead, which is also quite popular, as you can make very convenient incremental uh, updates to it using its copy method, 
this would get even worse syntactic syntactically. So uh, you can see that we are now repeating this ugly syntax on both sides of the assignment. Plus, we also have to do some kind of null handling on the right-hand side, since light data has nullability in its API, even though we know that we are never going to have a null value in the state. So this isn't great. Let's see how we can improve it. And we'll fix this by extending the base class a bit. We'll add a new property called view state, which is not going to be a live data, but instead it just has the generic view state type. And whenever you read the value of this property, it will grab the current value from the live data and it will return it to you as a non-null type. And whenever you write values into it, it will place those values into the live data for you. So this simplifies our client-side code greatly, uh, both when using a data class, uh, so that simplifies to something like this, and also when using the sealed class that we started with. Something that's worth noting is that by doing this, our client code no longer depends on live data in the view model. And this will continue to be true for the event handling part and also the, for the client code that we are going to write in the fragments. So none of the client code that's built on top of uh, Rainbow Cake depends on live data directly. All of the li live data usage is an implementation detail of the base classes, which means that it could plausibly be switched out for something else in the future. Uh, I'm going to get back to this at the very end of the talk. One more thing to discuss here within the view model, and that's the fact that we are updating the state from inside the coroutine. So whenever we are making these assignments to live data, and you can see that the property we have is using post value to update live data, that's happening within co the coroutine. Uh, why am I using post value and not just set value, which is the same as the value property used before? Well, if we were to use set value, then this would update the live data both the internal value that it holds, as well as the as well as perform the notification of all of its observers synchronously in a blocking way, and all of this would happen um, inside the execution context of a coroutine. So on the line where we write down something like view state equals loading, uh, we would be executing code inside the fragment, so the live data observer, which is modifying the UI and performing tasks like that. And we found that in practice, this was quite unexpected, that the fragments code that's uh, implemented way over there in another class is within the coroutine that started from the view model. So in order to decouple these updates, um, Rainbow Cake has switched to using post value instead. This is an asynchronous update. So it will uh, put the uh, value inside live data as a pending value, and it will actually update and notify observers when the main thread is free. This introduces a new issue which is that now if we read the value of our live data immediately after posting a new state into it, then we might not see those changes reflected yet because the asynchronous update hasn't happened yet. And when we read the value from live data manually like this, then we are going to receive the last value that has been delivered to observers and not the last one that we have uh, placed into the live data, which might still be pending. So in order to work around this and make the view state property behave in a predictable way where you can set a value into it, and then when you read it, you're going to get that value back all the time, uh, the view state is using a customized version of live data inside Rainbow Cake, which has the small tweak that if you read its value, it will return any pending values. So it will give you the value you've last posted inside the live data and not the value that has been last delivered, because these might be different things. With that, let's take a look at the fragment side of state handling. So we'll also have a base class here, which is called Rainbow Cake Fragment. Uh, shocking, I know. Inside here, we're going to store an instance of the view model. And this, again, will be a different type for each fragment. So we're going to make this a generic type, and we're going to constrain it to Rainbow Cake view model so that we can access any properties and methods on that type. We would, of course, provide this in the client code like this but we're not actually done with the definition of our, um, our framework code here, since we have used the Rainbow Cake view model type, which itself is generic. So we have to provide some kind of type parameter for it. So we're going to end up um, giving both the view state and the view model as generic type parameters to the fragment and, and updating that in the client code as well. From here, we can create our instance of our view model. So the base fragment will initialize your view model in the onAttach method. This is the first lifecycle method where you have a context, so it's quite safe to initialize a view model at this point. 
And this is done by calling the ProvideViewModel abstract method. This method can be implemented by your implementation class. If you want to use the Dagger or Coin integrations from RainbowCake, this is going to be a one-liner. You can call an extension function on RainbowCake fragment called getViewModel from factory, and this will give you a view model scoped to your current fragment. And you can also um, modify this using the parameters of the function so that you would get a view model scope to your parent fragment or to your host activity, or you have even more options. Again, you can see these in the documentation. One small thing I want to highlight here is that the call super annotation is used in a bunch of places. This doesn't really have anything to do with Rainbow Cake, but I think it's a fun thing to know about. So this is an annotation from Android X, and if you place it on a method, then if someone overrides the method and uh, forgets to call the super method, so in this case, if they override this and don't call super.onattach, then it will uh, emit a warning for them uh, through lint to make sure that they don't forget to do that. Uh, for example, with Rainbow Cake, if you skipped calling super in your onattach method, you would uh, remove the initialization of your view model and start crashing thanks to the late init variable. OK, we have a view model. We can now start observing it for state. We're going to do this in the onViewCreated method, which is quite important because we want to reobserve the state every time that the fragments uh, view is created, when a new instance of it is inflated, so that we can populate it with the data in the view state. And we're going to use the view lifecycle owner here so that these observations are cleaned up when the uh, view is destroyed. Again, more discussion about this in the Rainbow Cake documentation. Then inside the observer, what we're going to do is simply forward every view state value that we get to an abstract method, which is called render. And this is how the implementation class will get notified of state changes. So inside your fragment, you would implement the render method. Here, you're going to receive values of your view state. And you can, uh, in the case of using a sealed class, type check this and then update your UI accordingly. One thing to remember is that the when statement, the when construct in the language, is not exhaustive by default. So it doesn't guarantee that all of your cases will be covered uh, by the branches you've defined. So in order to make this exhaustive, you have to use the value of the block somehow. For example, by adding a dummy extension call on the very end, uh, Rainbow Cake ships with this exhaustive extension property, which doesn't do anything except for forcing your when to be an expression. And this would guarantee that you're covering all cases of your sealed class. For more about how to actually update your UI and what would go in the dotted out uh, sections of the slide, uh, you can, again, get more details in one of the articles. OK, and from here, we have one last thing to do in our fragment. We would have to trigger loading in the view model somewhere. This can happen in a whole bunch of different places, for example, in one of the lifecycle methods, depending on how often you want to reload your state. And uh, you can also make checks in your view model against your current state and see if you actually have to reload, of course. That's all for state handling with Rainbow Kick. So you are setting the view state property in your view model, and you will receive those values um, in your render function. And uh, behind the scenes, this is all powered by live data, so it's live cycle safe and everything. Let's move on to event handling now. If you've worked with MVVM before, you know that state handling is just part of this story. You also need to communicate from your view model to your view in a way where you only handle that communication once and um, you're not making permanent changes to your screen. So examples of this are, for example, showing messages, whether that's an operation completing successfully or failing, or triggering navigation in the UI layer. So let's see what Rainbow Cake does for event handling then. We're going to implement this in the same base classes that we've already had. And event handling will also be powered by live data in Rainbow Cake. Live data is great because it's lifecycle safe, so it will only deliver values when your observer is in a started active state. However, it has the drawback that it hangs on to values that you place into it. It, uh, it may deliver the value again to another observer even, and this is what we want to avoid happening with our events. So this, again, is going to take some customization of live data, and this is implemented in Rainbow Cake in a class called single shot live data. This is a live data which will only deliver the value that you place into it once to a single observer. You might have seen Google's single live event class before, which is some sample code from Google uh, that has been used in a couple of their applications and is now very widely adopted in, um, across the industry at this point. 
this is the same general idea, although this is a more detailed implementation of that same thing. Then it's going to be the exact same pattern as for state. So there's a public property which can be observed and a private one that can be updated. And we yet again have to pick a type for uh, what we're going to send as events from the view model. And we could go down the same route as with our view state. So we could add a generic type parameter to our view model for view events. We could add this to our fragment as well and into, your, into our client code. And we could define a sealed class for every single um, screen that we implement in our application. And we could make sure that all of the events are handled on the fragment side all the time. However, I found that we don't need events to be an essential part of every single screen in an app. So I've made these optional in Rainbow Kick, which means that we are going to lose this very strong typing for them. However, I found that in practice, this doesn't hurt as much. Um, we need that strong typing more for the state handling part of the application and then the event handling part. But we still need some kind of type here to pass into live data. And we don't want to just pass around any. Uh, so there is a marker interface in Rainbow Cake called one shot event, and every event has to implement this interface, and that's what's going to travel in the live data. Looking at the client side, then you could implement one shot event with objects or data classes, depending on whether they need parameters. And to send events, you would be setting the value inside this customized live data to an instance of a one shot event. Now. I didn't like this syntax for updating view state, and it's even worse for using it as the syntax for sending an event from your view model, since it looks like an assignment semantically. And you're not really storing a value here. You're just sending a value. It will be dispatched, it will be handled, and then it will be gone. So this looking like an assignment is not a great syntax. So Rainbow, Rainbow Cake does the simplest thing possible, which is to introduce a method that wraps this. So uh, there is a post event method in Rainbow Cake, and you're simply going to call that, yet again, hiding live data from the client side. You're just calling the method and passing in a value to it. OK, let's see how we can observe uh, uh, events then on the fragment side. We already had a lot of implementation here for handling view state. So we're going to continue from here. We had to observe view state in the lifecycle of the view because we wanted to re uh, deliver it when a new view was created so that we can update it. However, with events, this is not the case. We can observe events um, independently of the view lifecycle. So we can do this as soon as our view model exists, which is in the onAttach method. And we can use the fragment itself as the lifecycle owner in the observation. And um, then we are using the same pattern inside the observer, which we've already used for passing new view state to the implementation fragments. So we have a method here that they can override. This is now called onEvent. It's the same as render, but for events. And instead of being an abstract function, this is going to be an open function with an empty implementation uh, since event handling is optional. So you don't need to override this if you don't have events in a given screen. And if you do, overriding it will look a lot like rendering things. So uh, you do a type check on the event and then handle it with whatever code you want to implement in your fragment. Okay, let's take a step back and look at this visually now for a change. So this is the setup we have so far. We have a view model, we have a fragment observing it, and we have this single shot live data implementation in the middle. And whenever we post a value inside there, the fragment will observe it. And practically speaking, that value will be gone from the live data. I've already mentioned that live data is lifecycle safe. So when the fragment is not an active observer, so for example, we've navigated away from it, but it's still in memory, then we might still be sending events from the view model. And these wouldn't be delivered until the fragment uh, reappears as an observer, which means that if we send multiple events while this is happening, then only the very last event will be delivered to the fragment when it eventually comes back around. And we are going to lose all of the previous events that we try to send from the view model. This isn't great because it makes for unpredictable behavior. So let's fine tune this live data by customizing it even further. So we're going to go from a single shot live data, which we've had before in the view model, to a queued single shot live data. Again, you can find the sources for this later. But you probably get the general idea at this point. This is a live data which delivers values just once, but it also contains a queue internally so that it can hold on to more than one value at a time. 
This means that if our fragment is not active, then we can post multiple values. These will be stored in the live data. And whenever the fragment comes back around, it will receive all of these events in order um, as we have sent them. This, uh, uh, this issue of possibly losing events is more of a problem if you have a single live data being used for all of your events. If you create different live data for each type of event, this will happen less, but it still might happen if you send multiple events of the same type while your fragment isn't around. So this is worth considering in either case. Then a huge pitfall of live data-based uh, implementations for events is multiple observers. Whether you're using one of these uh, live data implementations in Rainbow Cake that we had so far, or you're using just a single live event, if you try to attach multiple observers to your view model, you're going to have a bad time since it will only deliver these values to one of the fragments, which again is unpredictable and you don't want that kind of behavior in your applications. Rainbow Cake solves this by introducing some abstraction in the middle of this. So instead of having just one queue in these cases, Rainbow Cake will have a collection of live data in a container. And whenever you send an event from your view model, it will place that event into multiple live data instances. And every fragment observing the same view model actually observes a different live data under the hood so that they all receive these events. Let's take a look at the implementation of this real quickly. This is um, quite simple overall. So we have two interfaces here. One of them is a live data collection, and then there's a mutable variant. You can see that they have methods that are uh, copied from live data's interface, so observe set value and post value. And they also mimic the way that collections work in the Kotlin standard library. We have a read-only interface and then a, a mutable variant of it, which extends the previous one. As for the implementation, there is an implementation class for this in Rainbow Cake, and it takes a parameter, uh, which is a factory. This factory takes no parameters. It's a function type, and it returns a mutable live data instance. We're going to use this in just a moment. Inside the class, we have a set of live data that we are keeping track of. And whenever someone observes this collection, then the um, factory that we've taken as a parameter will be invoked, which creates a new live data instance. We're going to place this in the active set. And we're going to hook up the observer that we've received to that new live data. And we'll also register some cleanup logic so that these live data are removed when needed. We're going to skip over that for now. Finally, for the set value and post value implementations, these are going to be quite simple. We are just iterating through all of the contained live data and calling the methods of the same names on them. Then at the uh, base class, um, on the base class side, we're going to update our current single instance of Qt single shot live data to a collection of these uh, so that we can create multiple as needed for multiple observers. And remember that we had a factory uh, parameter here, which has to be a function that returns a live data. Well, a function like this is the constructor of our custom live data, data class. So we can just pass in that as the parameter using a method reference. We would, of course, also update the uh, read-only side, so the public property. And the good news is that we don't have to make any more changes to our existing code. So using the collection it has the same syntax as using the live data. So we can post values into it and observe it the exact same way. Then I would like to uh, show you one last problem with events, which is exactly the queuing behavior that we have introduced. So if you think about it, when you start queuing events and uh, holding onto them until the fragment comes back around, you introduce a weird potential latency to your events. So whenever you send an event in your view model, you probably expect to receive it in your fragment straight away. This doesn't mean synchronously and literally immediately, but fairly soon. You expect that to be at the same time, roughly. But if you start queuing events like this, that means that you might hold on to them for a good long while while the fragment is inactive. So your events that you're sending might be processed in the fragment minutes from now. And if you have sent something like a navigation event, then it might not make any sense anymore. In fact, for most events that you send from your view model, you probably have this assumption that they will be processed immediately. So by default, Rainbow Cake is going to go back to um, delivering events uh, without queuing. And it actually keeps both of these behaviors. So 
let's see the code for this. There is going to be a collection of active only single shot live data instances. This is yet another customization. And it's a live data that delivers values only once. And it only delivers values if it has an active observer at the time. And otherwise, it simply drops the values and makes sure that it won't be delivered at a later time, which could be unpredictable for you. And this is what happens by default in Rainbow Cake. So using the post event function and the one shot event marker interface, we'll use this mechanism, which only delivers values if it can do that immediately, and otherwise it drops them. However, there are still events which you might want to um, make sure are delivered, even if that happens at a later time. For example, some kind of message that you want to um, display on the UI in any case. So for that, there is also a separate collection of queued single shot live data, which we've already seen. But if you want to use these, you're going to have a bit of a harder time, just a tiny bit. So you have to implement a special marker interface called queued one shot event and use a separate function. Uh, this is just to make sure that you know about this mechanism and that your events might be handled later than you expect it to. The second interface, the second marker interface, simply extends the first one. This means that in our fragment, we have a very easy time of integrating these two. We'll simply observe both of them in onAttach and pass on any values from either of these live datas that we observe to the onEvent function. So you can handle both of these things the same way on the client side. And if you need to differentiate between them, if you need to know that an event was queued, you can always just type check it. Putting this visually, this gets just a bit scary. So this is what happens in Rainbow Cake when you have multiple fragments observing a view model. Each of these fragments will get a queued and a non-queued live data in the respective collections. And in the simplest case, this means that we'll have just a uh, single live data in each of these collections, and you can pick which one to use for sending events to your fragment. OK, um, so a valid point of criticism is that all of this relies on hacking around with live data which is absolutely true, although it sounds a lot better if you call these customizations instead of hacks. But at the end of the day, that's what they are. And uh, the good news is that these are all unit tested. So you can take a look at the source code. You can take a look at the tests. Um, so it's ensured that these customizations do work. And if live data updates break them, then tests are going to start failing. So they can always be fixed. And if there aren't any tests, you can feel free to contribute more. Um, but the point is that they are unit tested and they have also been used in production already. So we don't know that they do work, even though they seem a bit hacky on the inside. Plus, remember that the client code has no dependencies on live data. So if something better comes along to implement these in the base classes, whether it's state flow, shared flow, or something else entirely, then this can be swapped out seamlessly in the framework. So I'm very open to ideas on how to clean up all of this. But for the time being, this is something that works well. So that's your quite quick introduction to state handling and event handling in Rainbow Cake. If you want to find out more about the framework, you can go to the official website, which is rainbowcake.dev. So that's where you'll find the documentation. You can also find it on GitHub, which is uh, rainbowcake slash rainbowcake for the uh, core library repository. So that's where the um, packages that you can include in your code um, are uh, stored. But there are also other repos within the same GitHub organization, which contain sample code and starter projects and stuff like that. So you might also want to take a look at that. Also, for more written content on the ideas behind Rainbow Cake on working with single view state and um, general things about state and event handling uh, on Android, you can take a look at my blog, where I am releasing a series of articles on these topics. Uh, the first few of these are already out, but they are going to be appearing over the next few weeks. And with that, I would like to thank you all very much for attending this, this talk today. You can find all the resources that I kept pointing to on my website on the talks page. And if you want to follow either me or just the general development of Rainbow Cake and the news about it, the best way to do that is on Twitter. So. I think that's all for today. Uh, again, thank you for your time. Have a nice Scotland. And I have to check if we have time for a few questions. I think we do. We have five minutes or so left. 
there's a whole bunch of things in the chat and I'm not sure I'll be able to catch up with them. Oh, awesome. The very last question is, what did I use for the presentation? This is PowerPoint. That was the first question I answered last year at Kotliners. So it's only fitting that I do that again. OK, I don't see any more questions in the chat that can be answered easily. So I think I'm going to wrap this up. And you'll be able to find me both in, in the uh, Kotlin chat. You can also PM me on the Kotlin Lang Slack if you want to ask something. And you can also reach me on Twitter and in a whole bunch of other places. So uh, that's it. Thank you.